The greatest battle we face is not against flesh and blood, but against the unseen powers that seek to control our lives. Imagine if every single day in your seemingly innocent habits, you were unknowingly opening doors to forces that want nothing more than to drag you into darkness. Small actions, minor routines that feel harmless, yet they might be creating a silent invitation, drawing in the very things you'd never willingly allow into your life. Have you ever wondered if your daily actions, the ones you barely think about, could be affecting you on a spiritual level? Perhaps you felt the pull of negativity or sensed a shadow lurking just out of sight. This isn't just superstition or a story to scare you. These are real spiritual dynamics at play that we often overlook. Today, we're pulling back the veil to reveal how these five everyday habits could be granting permission to dark influences to enter your life. We're going to uncover each habit, one by one, dissecting why they're so dangerous and how they operate beneath the surface. And at the end of this journey, I'll share one powerful biblical step you can take to cleanse your life and protect yourself from these unseen threats. You'll leave knowing exactly how to close every door with a renewed strength to reclaim control of your spiritual space. So stick with me until the end, not just to discover these habits, but to learn the one often forgotten step that could shield you from spiritual harm once and for all. And remember, there's a song that perfectly captures the essence of today's discussion, so don't miss it. Subtle desensitization, entertainment, and media choices. Picture this. A man stands on the shore looking out over the vast ocean. He steps into the water, just to his ankles, feeling the cool waves wash over his feet. Harmless, he thinks, as he wades in a little deeper, letting the water rise to his knees, then his waist. Slowly, he ventures further, each step taking him deeper without much thought. But suddenly, he feels a strong undercurrent pull against him. In an instant, he realizes he's drifted far from shore, farther than he intended, with no footing beneath him. This is what happens when we become subtly desensitized through the media we consume. We open the gate of our minds to seemingly small, insignificant influences, not realizing that each one is slowly dulling our spiritual senses. It starts small, a movie here, a song there, maybe a show with themes that glorify darkness, revenge, or powers outside of God's light. But before we know it, we find ourselves accepting what we once would have rejected, desiring what we once would have avoided. We might even begin to see darkness not as a threat, but as something intriguing, harmless, or even entertaining. You see, Scripture warns us of the dangers that come from letting our guard down in seemingly small ways. In Philippians 4.8, we're advised to dwell on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. This isn't just a suggestion. It's a safeguard. Just as a gardener actively chooses which plants to nurture and which weeds to pull, we are called to be intentional about what we allow into the garden of our minds. But the world we live in makes it hard, doesn't it? Everywhere we turn, media and entertainment present darkness as if it's just part of the package. Supernatural powers, occult symbols, revenge-driven heroes. It's all dressed up in an appealing wrapper. We're told it's just a story or it's harmless fun. But is it really harmless? Ask yourself, what do these stories plant in our minds? Do they inspire us to seek God, to dwell on what is good and pure? Or do they introduce seeds of doubt, fear, or even fascination with the very things God has warned us against? Let's consider the impact of regular exposure. Picture a frog in a pot of cool water. The heat is turned up ever so slowly, and the frog adjusts, not realizing it's in danger, until it's too late. This is how spiritual desensitization works. The enemy doesn't come roaring in, making bold declarations. No, he slips in quietly, slowly adjusting the temperature of our hearts. Little by little, he makes the darkness seem normal, acceptable, even desirable. And in doing so, he dulls our sensitivity to what is holy and pure, creating openings for more subtle yet harmful spiritual influences. And let's not be mistaken, these aren't harmless effects. When we constantly absorb content that glorifies the occult, the supernatural, or human vengeance, we invite these influences into our lives. This is exactly why God's Word encourages us to fill our minds with what is pure and good. By dwelling on godly virtues, 
we build a hedge of protection around our hearts and minds. Philippians 4.8 isn't just a call to avoid sin. It's a call to protect the sanctity of our spiritual garden, keeping out the weeds before they take root. You may think, but I can handle it, it doesn't affect me. Perhaps you can watch, listen, and consume without noticing immediate effects. But like the young man in the garden, each weed has a way of quietly establishing itself, gradually reshaping the landscape. Each time we allow darkness to entertain us, it becomes a little less foreign, a little less shocking. And one day we might look at our spiritual garden and realize it's overgrown with thorns and thistles. So as we consider our media choices, let's ask ourselves, are we opening the gate to things that glorify God, or things that glorify the very forces that seek to undermine Him? Remember, desensitization doesn't happen all at once. It's a slow, almost imperceptible decline. But with each choice, we're either drawing closer to God, or drifting further away. As we continue on this journey through the habits that might invite darkness, let's keep our spiritual garden in mind. Let's be intentional, discerning, and ever mindful of the influences we allow in. For just as a gardener must vigilantly guard against weeds, we too must guard our hearts and minds against influences that seek to dull our spiritual senses and lead us away from the light. Unconscious Idolatry Prioritizing Materialism and Status Imagine a young man who inherits a beautiful old violin, crafted with care by a master. It's priceless, not just in worth, but in history and craftsmanship. At first, he cherishes it, displaying it proudly, polishing it, and even learning to play a few notes. But over time, he becomes busy with other things, with pursuits he finds more exciting and profitable. The violin gets pushed aside, collecting dust, until one day he doesn't even remember where he left it. In its place, he fills his time and attention with flashy gadgets, luxury items, and a constant pursuit of more. He's lost sight of the priceless treasure he once held, and as he looks around, everything he owns feels hollow and fleeting. The pursuit of material things has crowded out something truly valuable. This is how many of us treat our relationship with God. Like that violin, the presence of God is a treasure, something priceless meant to be cherished and central to our lives. But we live in a world that constantly pushes us to pursue more wealth, status, and possessions. These things can easily take the place of God in our hearts, not out of malice, but through slow neglect. In the end, we find ourselves surrounded by things that are beautiful on the outside, but empty within. This story mirrors what so many of us do in our own lives when we allow our focus to shift toward materialism, status, and wealth. In today's world, idolatry doesn't look like bowing to statues or images. It's often the silent elevation of things like success, possessions, and recognition above our relationship with God. We may not even realize it, but when we pursue material goals without God at the foundation, we're building our lives on sand, and that leaves us vulnerable. Jesus warned about this very thing in Matthew 6.24, saying, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Here, mammon represents wealth, possessions, or material success, anything we set up in competition with God. When our primary pursuit is wealth or status, we make it our master, taking the place that only God should occupy. Imagine a person who spends every waking moment working to climb the career ladder, accumulating possessions and seeking validation through worldly achievements. These things can quickly fill their thoughts, energy, and time. They may start believing that if they just achieve enough, they'll be fulfilled. But here's the catch. Materialism and the pursuit of status are bottomless pits. No matter how much you accumulate, it never feels like enough. The more we pursue them, the more they pull us away from the very source of true satisfaction, God. The danger in making material success or status our focus is that it subtly shifts our trust away from God and onto ourselves. We begin to believe that our security, our identity, and our worth are defined by our possessions and accomplishments. This shift creates a spiritual void, a place in our hearts meant for God, but filled instead with temporary things. And here's the thing. That void doesn't stay empty for long. It's a space that darker forces are all too eager to occupy. 
When we're distracted by materialism, we lose sight of our spiritual needs and become less vigilant in guarding our hearts. This is where the danger truly lies. The enemy takes advantage of that distracted, weakened state. We become like that unfinished house, built without a foundation, easily breached and unstable. So let's ask ourselves, what are we building our lives on? Are we placing all our effort and trust in things that are temporary, or are we allowing God to be the firm foundation? Remember, material things are fleeting, but God's love and truth endure forever. Let's continue examining our lives, thinking not just about what we own, but about what truly owns us. As we move forward, we'll see how other habits and influences can take root in a heart that's unguarded. But for now, let's keep in mind that anything we prioritize over God ultimately leads us further from Him, leaving a space that the enemy is eager to fill. Holding on to resentment, harboring unforgiveness and bitterness, Resentment is a lot like a thorn buried deep beneath the skin. At first, it's only a small sting, hardly noticeable. But left unattended, it festers. Slowly, infection spreads, causing pain that seeps into every part of our being. Holding on to resentment, allowing bitterness to take root in our hearts, is just like that thorn. What begins as a small offense, a slight sting of anger, becomes a wound that consumes our peace, our joy, and our spiritual health. Harboring unforgiveness is dangerous for one main reason. It opens a door to darkness. Bitterness is fertile ground for the enemy. When we refuse to let go of hurt or offense, it creates a crack in our spiritual armor, a foothold that darker forces exploit. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 gives us this warning. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath neither give place to the devil. In essence, it's saying, deal with your anger, don't let it settle in. Yet, how many of us have been tempted to nurture anger instead of releasing it? A wrong word, a betrayal, a lingering sense of injustice. These can all grip us so tightly that forgiving feels impossible. We may think they don't deserve forgiveness or I'll forgive, but I won't forget. But here's the truth. When we allow bitterness to stay, it's like inviting darkness to set up camp within us. And once it's there, it grows, gaining strength, wrapping around us like chains that rob us of peace and freedom. Consider the story of two prisoners. One man was unjustly jailed and could not forgive his accuser. Day after day, he plotted revenge, feeding on hatred. The other prisoner, also unfairly imprisoned, chose to forgive, releasing his bitterness. Though both remained behind bars, one man's heart was free while the other's was trapped in a prison of resentment. This is what unforgiveness does to us. Even when we think we are punishing the other person, we end up chained to our own anger. Forgiveness, on the other hand, breaks these chains. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, it requires humility and sometimes repeated efforts. But forgiveness is not just a release for the person who wronged us. It's a release for ourselves. It's a shield a way to protect our spiritual defenses. When we forgive, we close that door, preventing evil forces from taking advantage of our vulnerability. When we cling to bitterness, we give permission for anger and darkness to fester. Yet in choosing forgiveness, we choose light, freedom and spiritual strength. And that's what allows us to move forward, steadfast, protected and at peace. Now let's turn our attention to the next subtle trap that can weaken our defenses, a trap that we may not even recognize as dangerous. Engaging in spiritual compromise, small choices that lead away from faith. Picture a ship setting sail on a clear day, navigating toward a far off destination. The captain makes a tiny adjustment, just a single degree off course. It seems insignificant, hardly worth a second thought. But, over time, that one-degree shift becomes a massive deviation. By the end of the journey, the ship ends up miles away from its intended port, nowhere near its destination. This is the nature of spiritual compromise. It starts with the smallest step. A white lie here, a neglected prayer there. A decision to keep silent when you should speak up. The choices seem harmless, perhaps even practical at the time. But each one, however small, has the potential to divert us from the path God has set before us. What starts as a slight deviation from the truth becomes a journey down a road we never meant to take. 
In James 4, 7 and 8, we are given clear guidance. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Notice the word resist. Resisting begins not in grand battles, but in the small everyday decisions where we choose whether to stay true to God or to make a harmless compromise. When we choose loyalty to God in even the smallest matters, we close the door to the devil. But when we make exceptions, we crack open that door, giving him a foothold. Consider this. What are some examples of these small choices that can lead us astray? Perhaps it's a little dishonesty at work, exaggerating hours or claiming credit for something we didn't fully do. Maybe it's the occasional decision to skip time with God thinking, I'll pray tomorrow, or letting the Bible collect dust because we're too busy. Then there are moral compromises in relationships, a choice to bend boundaries or let worldly influences shape our values. Each decision, though small, shapes the direction of our journey. Each compromise builds upon the last, slowly chipping away at our spiritual integrity. These compromises weaken our connection to God, not all at once, but gradually, making it easier for darker influences to slip in unnoticed. Like water seeping into the smallest crack in a dam, small deviations create vulnerabilities. Left unchecked, they become gateways for forces that seek to exploit our lack of vigilance. The enemy doesn't often come at us with blatant temptations. He's much craftier than that. Instead, he works in subtle ways nudging us, ever so gently, off course until we're no longer facing the destination we set out for. Let's be honest, resisting these small compromises isn't always easy. It takes discernment and courage to recognize them for what they are. But it is in the little choices that our faith is truly tested. When we commit to integrity in all areas of life, however minor they may seem, we build a strong foundation. We establish a habit of faithfulness, closing off access points that the enemy might use to erode our defenses. And so, as we move forward, let us reflect on those small choices we make each day. Are we willing to submit even our small decisions to God, trusting that He sees and cares about each one? Because in the end, it is those daily decisions, those small acts of faithfulness, that keep us firmly on the path toward Him. Now let's move to another area where our vigilance matters one that we might not recognize as harmful, yet it carries spiritual consequences. Practicing unaware spiritualism, attraction to mystical practices. Consider a young woman who, out of curiosity, begins to follow her horoscope each morning. She thinks of it as a harmless little ritual, something lighthearted, a way to get a glimpse of what the day might hold. Over time, though, she finds herself drawn in deeper, she begins consulting more detailed astrological readings, soon adding crystals to her routine for energy, and occasionally consulting tarot cards to reveal hidden truths. What began as simple curiosity becomes something she depends on, something that subtly shapes her choices, even her sense of identity. In our world, practices like astrology, tarot, crystals, and horoscopes are marketed as fun, and insightful ways to find yourself or feel connected to some unseen force. They seem harmless enough, packaged as trendy ways to understand life and love. But the Bible gives us a much different perspective. In Deuteronomy 18, 10-12, we find a stern warning from God. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do, these things are an abomination unto the Lord. God leaves no room for doubt here. He's serious about the dangers these practices pose. Why does God speak so strongly against these things? Because they pull us away from Him inviting us to seek answers, power, and control outside of His presence. When we turn to these practices, we align ourselves with powers that are opposed to God's Spirit. They promise insight, protection, or strength, but ultimately lead us toward a dependency that weakens our faith. Just as the young woman who began her day with a horoscope found herself drawn further away from God, 
These practices can capture our hearts, leading us down a path that ends far from where we began. The deception is in their appearance. Astrology, for example, is often presented as an ancient science rather than what it is. A form of divination that seeks guidance from stars rather than the creator of those stars. Crystals are said to hold healing energies, yet they subtly replace prayer and reliance on God's healing power. Tarot cards, advertised as a way to discover yourself, can slowly make you believe that your life's answers lie in cards rather than in God's word. Each of these things may seem harmless on the surface, yet each one opens a door, inviting spiritual influences that run contrary to God's spirit. Turning to these practices places our trust in something other than God. And this is where the spiritual danger lies. Just as a house divided cannot stand, a heart divided cannot fully serve God. By seeking guidance or energy from anything other than the Holy Spirit, we create a space that dark forces are eager to fill. And when we step outside of God's protection, we open ourselves to spiritual harm, often without even realizing it. God offers a better way. His wisdom, His Word, and His Spirit provide everything we need to navigate life. In James 1.5, we are told, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. God promises to provide wisdom to those who seek it directly from him. There's no need to look elsewhere, no need to dabble in practices that might pull us into spiritual harm. The world will tell us that we're just exploring or opening our minds with these mystical practices, but God calls us to something higher, to a path of truth and faith. True spiritual strength, identity, and wisdom are found in him alone without dependency on anything that stands in opposition to his light. As we move forward, may we examine the sources of influence in our lives, closing doors that don't lead us to God and seeking his guidance in all things. Let us journey onward, grounded in faith and protected by his love, as we continue exploring other practices that may quietly undermine our walk with him. The Promise of Spiritual Cleansing and Protection as we come to the close of this journey, let's take a moment to remember why we started. Our purpose wasn't just to expose the influences that can draw us away from God, but to give each of us a way to protect and purify our lives from these influences, to restore our relationship with the one who loves us beyond measure. The path to spiritual strength and purity begins in the heart. In Psalm 51 verse 10, we find a powerful prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This isn't just a request. It's a complete surrender to God's transformative power. Imagine your heart as a garden that has collected weeds over time. Weeds that might look small at first, but that can choke out healthy growth. When we ask God to cleanse our hearts, we're inviting Him to remove those weeds, to restore us from within, so that only His light shines through. Let's make this a daily practice, inviting God every day to renew our hearts, to purify our intentions, and to protect us from influences that might distract us from Him. Imagine the strength that comes from consistently surrendering your spirit to God's protection and guidance, how it shapes not only our actions, but also the peace and purity that guard our minds. If you're watching this far, let's make a commitment together. Comment. Renew me, O Lord as a declaration of your desire to stay spiritually strong, to live a life cleansed and protected in God's love. This commitment isn't just a one-time choice. It's a path, a journey we take every day, trusting that God is faithful to guide and protect us. As we reflect on all we've discussed, I invite you to examine your life. Take time to consider those small habits, those minor routines that may be pulling you away from God without you even realizing it. And remember that through Christ, every single one of us has the power to transform. A renewed focus on Christ can reshape our lives, guiding our daily choices and building a wall of protection against unseen dangers. This transformation is the promise of His love, a love that not only forgives but empowers and cleanses. If you found today's discussion valuable, consider subscribing. Our journey here is dedicated to helping one another grow in spiritual strength to live protected in God's guidance, and to uncover new depths of faith. Together, 
We'll continue exploring these topics with biblical truth and purpose. And now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, grateful for your love and protection. Reveal to us, Lord, any hidden habits or influences that might be taking root in our lives, drawing us away from your light. Give us strength, Lord, to resist these distractions and to replace them with habits that honor you. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. May your peace guard our minds, and may your love be the foundation of our lives. Protect each of us here, Father, and draw us closer to you each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's carry this prayer with us, trusting that God will cleanse and guide us, keeping us steadfast in his grace and light as we go forward. Now you can engage even more and support this channel by becoming a member. 
Becoming a member unlocks amazing resources and helps you connect even deeper. Get access to every image I use, perfect for your wallpaper, studies, or presentations. Need a custom visual for a study group or a Bible verse that speaks to you? I'll design it. And members get to suggest entire video topics they'd love to see explored. Honestly, this is about more than perks. It's your chance to directly shape the content and help me create videos that matter most to you. Check the description for details. Thanks so much for being part of this community. God bless.